Well, Sam, thanks for joining us today to talk a little bit about health equity and health disparities in terms of the COVID response and COVID pandemic. Can you just briefly go over for us a little bit of the ways that health equity has played a role in this pandemic? Yeah, thanks, Justin. Really excited to, to join you today. You know, since the pandemic hit us uh, in late February, early March, I think, you know, some of the things we've seen, it clearly a disproportionate impact on minority communities. You know, as of early this week, we're seeing that, you know, Blacks are estimating against by age-adjusted COVID mortality. Uh, Blacks are three times, you know, close to 4X, uh, the death rate of whites, Hispanic uh, and Latinx 2.5 times, American Indians, you know, 3.2 times. Uh, and so it's just like disproportionately impacting uh, all these uh, communities of color. Uh, and I want to ask like why, you know, I think there are a few factors to, to, to look at and un unpack a little bit. I think one is just around socioeconomic factors of housing, employment, uh, food security. Um, I think the second is around clinical health risk, right? So we, we, we know that for chronic disease, different comorbidities, uh, health behaviors, and just uh, stress levels are more prevalent in uh, communities of color. You know, another thing we've also seen is around access to care uh, and information. Um, you know, it, w when we take a look at some of our different communities and what infrastructure exists, um, it, it's just been really challenging. Yeah. Uh, from that, and, and this has just amplified, I would say, the, 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 the rate of cases and deaths that we've seen in communities of color. Yeah, and it's important to note that these aren't new disparities created by COVID. These are amplifications of disparities that were already there, right? Exactly. You know, if you look at housing challenges, they've, they've long existed for a while. If you look at uh, access to care, right? So even in our own home state of Minnesota, I, I believe, you know, the average uninsurance or uninsured population is about 12% for, for Blacks, and I believe in a 20% for American Indians uh, versus 5% or 4 to 5% for, for white Minnesotans. So th th these are things already been, and, and if you think about it, uh, things that we have some orders, right, executive orders in place where you, you didn't need, uh, you don't need a referral, but when COVID started, you actually needed a referral to see yeah. a doctor. And if you don't have insurance or, you know, you're on Medicaid and you don't have a primary care, that just puts you at a disadvantage. Yeah, definitely. What are some barriers to, to treating people in COVID that fall on equity lines? Like where are some, some areas that we're missing the boat when we're trying to treat people? Yeah, so, you know, as we went into stay at home orders, one thing that became very challenging is, you know, before going to a hospital, people were told it had to be an emergency. So most of us, you and myself, we've been fortunate enough without commercial insurance we have to use telehealth as an example. But if you think of others, uh, you know, and I know we, we tried to move quickly to get others, uh, other groups, like Medicaid, um, uh, folks, Medicare, to be able to use telehealth. But if you think to the big digital divide that we have, right, and, and, and even in Minnesota, what it's if, if you if you live in rural Minnesota, that's yeah. a different challenge. Uh, and so I think those are barriers. So others have had the ability and easy accessibility to to getting care by telehealth. But that divide still exists for minority uh, communities and also, I think, folks that live in rural America. Yeah, that's a huge challenge. So let me ask you one more question, Sam. As we start to slowly reopen our, our society, our country, what, what are things that we should keep an eye on that create more disparities in the way we approach reopening? To? Yeah, so I, I think, you know, we, we have health professionals um, to provide uh, data inputs, right, for our leaders to make decisions, whether it's at the company level, at the government level, you know, making sure that you're taking the inputs from health uh, advisors as a piece of uh, decision making. But one simple thing we've seen even is like as hospitals reopen their, their uh, outpatient facilities, I've seen some examples where, you know, to protect everyone, you're told not to bring kids uh, as an right. example. But, you know, picture a single mom or a single dad um, with a, a kid or two and they can't get that person to daycare. Now you're at a loss of actually going to get care. So I think as we think through all the options of reopening, safety is foremost number one. Let's, let's make sure we're safe. We're protecting each other. We're taking inputs from health professionals. We're being smart. Um, but let's just remember that there, you know, there are others that face disadvantages and we're getting those perspectives in to make sure that as we reopen, it's equitable uh, for all.
That's really important to keep in mind. Thanks for taking a few minutes to talk to us today, Sam. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. And, and, and for everyone out there, you know, American Heart Association is doing really great work in our community. So let's make sure we keep supporting the work that you do. Great. And thanks for your service to the American Heart Association, too. Thank you.